All right, here's a quick tutorial video on the fundamental theorem of calculus, sometimes referred to as the part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus, where part two is what's commonly referred to as the evaluation theorem. At any rate, this mess in here is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Informally, it says that the derivative of the integral is just a function, that derivatives and integrals kind of cancel each other out, loosely speaking. Okay. Uh, I think what I want out of the fundamental theorem of calculus, at least for our classes, I kind of wanted you to understand why the fundamental theorem of calculus is true. And we can kind of do that with an integral. So before you even look at what the fundamental theorem of calculus is, let's take a look at this problem. You're like, how can I figure out this problem if I don't even understand what this is? Just take this naively. Suppose you were told that f of x, I'll copy it here for no apparent reason, um, is equal to the integral from 2 to x of 3t squared. Dt. You're like, this is kind of weird. Like, I've done stuff kind of like this where I'm evaluating definite integrals. I'm used to these both being numbers, 2 and 5 maybe. Uh, but fine, I guess I can deal with this. Uh, if I wanted to evaluate this definite integral, I'd first find the antiderivative of 3t squared. And hopefully you're comfortable with that being t cubed. But then I wouldn't be done. I'd have to evaluate that antiderivative from 2 to x. And you haven't evaluated, at least in our class, from 2 to x. You've evaluated from like, I don't know, 2 to 4 or something. But the same methods work, where you take the number on top and you change all of your variable into that number, so x is in this case. And then you do the same, you subtract what you get if you change all of the variable, the t's, into twos. So I'd have 2 cubed. Well, I guess I could write that. Um, and 2 cubed is the number 8. So what I'm saying is f of x is equal to x cubed minus 8. Okay, so what? Well, what this question is saying is if f of x equals this, what is f prime of x? Well, now that I have f of x written in a more manageable form, I can find f prime of x, right? I know f of x, I can find f prime of x. I took uh, calculus 1. If I have a function, I could find its derivative. x cubed, the derivative there is 3x squared using the power rule. And then because this minus 8 is a constant, the derivative is just 0. I get f prime of x equals 3x squared. So the answer to this question would be 3x squared. If you look at that answer, you might notice that it more or less appeared in the original question. Right? This 3t squared, all I did was I changed the t's into x's. All the fundamental theorem of calculus tells you is that if you're in this somewhat contrived situation where a function is defined in terms of a definite integral, and the upper bound on that definite integral is the variable x, then f prime of x, the derivative of this function, the derivative of this integral, is just going to be this function right here. You essentially just copy this right here. Yeah, you got to change the letters. Instead of a t, it's an x, because I use x here, so I can't use an x here. So I pick some other variable, typically t, to put here. But don't let that trip you up too much. It wants f prime of x. Sorry, it wants f prime of x. So the variable's got to be x. So you just write in x's. So the answer was 3x squared. I knew that right off the bat. But really, the purpose in our class of the fundamental theorem of calculus is sort of understanding why this works. And you see why it works as you work through an example like this. Although, to be fair, we knew what the answer was going to be right off the bat, which is kind of nice. I'm going to require you to show all this, or at least something similar, as I'll show you in the next example. But it's nice knowing what the answer is going to be before you even do all this work. right? Um, so that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Essentially, it tells you that the derivative of the integral is the function, that if I have a function that is set up, it's defined to be an integral in a form like this, then the derivative of that function, if I take the derivative of this thing right here, the derivative part and this integral part kind of cancel each other out, and I'm left with just g of x. This Whatever this function is, just change your variable. So if we had a harder example like down here, we know exactly what the answer should be at the end. Right, find f prime of x, no problem. f prime of x would be, well, let's see, here's f of x. I want the derivative of this function. The derivative and the integral part will cancel each other out. I just gotta copy exactly what's written here. So I will get 3x squared, or I guess I should say exactly what's written here if I change all the t's into x's. So 3x squared over one plus x cubed. That's gonna be my final answer. Right? That's what I'm gonna end up with. The important step that you'll want to be able to do is show why that's true. And you're like, all right, all right, I'll do that again. I'll find the antiderivative and I'll plug stuff in, blah, blah, blah. Well, here it's a little bit challenging. I don't think you could find this antiderivative. Why? Because you haven't yet learned this technique 
called U substitutions. We're going to learn in the next section. So at this point in the class, you don't know this antiderivative. However, we can still get to this answer, which is kind of crazy, right? Because if you think about what we did up here, we had to first figure out the antiderivative so we could evaluate this integral. We needed this t cubed to get this x cubed minus 8 so we could take the derivative and get up here. It turns out that you can get all the way here. You can justify the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is what I'm asking you to do, without being able to do this step. And here's how you do it. You do it with like a substitution, and not a u substitution, which allows you to find this antiderivative. More on that in our next section. But instead, you say, all right, uh, why don't I give this thing a name right here, this function in here. Let's let this thing, what, 3t squared over... 1 plus t cubed, Let me write that. Um, let's give that a name. Maybe we call it g of t. Right, then what this function is, f of x, it's just equal to, sorry about my loud dog, the integral from 2 to x, and that's not fun, of, well, instead of writing this function right here, I can write g of t. Maybe my dog will continue to bark throughout this entire video, maybe not. Right, so what I did is I replaced what's written right here with what I'm calling it, g of t. And then what I want to do is find the antiderivative of this thing. And you're like, oh, the antiderivative of this? I thought you said I didn't know how to do that. True, but if we write it generally, little g of t, you've learned that the antiderivative of little g of little some letter of t is just capital that letter of t. The antiderivative of little g of t is defined to be capital G of t. So what I want is that antiderivative evaluated from 2 to x. Instead of changing 3t squared into t cubed, what I can do in an instance where I don't know hey, enough to figure out the antiderivative is this little substitution trick. And so let's follow this all the way through. What I'm doing is I'm finding the antiderivative. So think when you see this capital G of t, think t cubed. And what I want to do is I want to evaluate that from x to 2. I chose x and 2. This doesn't have to always be a 2. It's coincidental. It's any constant here will do. So how do you evaluate this at x? Well, you change all the t's into x's, right? Just like I changed all these t's into x's and all these t's into 2's. Change all these t's into x's and all these t's into 2's. I get capital G of x minus capital G of 2. Uh, all right. So what have I done? Well, this is f of x, right? I haven't taken any derivatives at all f of x equals this thing. I don't want f of x, I want f prime of x. So what I have to do is take the derivative of this line. What's the derivative of this line? The derivative of capital G of x is little g of x, right? By definition, the antiderivative of little g of x is capital G of x, so the derivative of capital G of x is a little g of x. All right, what about the derivative of g of 2? Well, I don't know what the function capital G of X is, but when I change all the X's into two, it's equal to some number. I don't know what that number is, but it doesn't matter what that number is because that number is a constant. And when I take the derivative of a constant, that's just equal to zero. So F prime of X is equal to G of X. And we, are, we know what G of X is because G of two is defined up here. So G of X is just this thing if you change all the T's into X's, which is exactly what I have written right here. So the big takeaway here from problems one and two is that you can kind of prove, you can demonstrate the fundamental theorem of calculus. I don't know if prove is the right word. Um, if you know the antiderivative, which is great, but even in a case like this where you don't know the antiderivative, and for this specific example, we're later going to figure out how to find this antiderivative so it's not a big deal. But what we'll see is there's functions for which the antiderivative is not even an elementary function. It's not even anything we can figure out. But we can still do this method and figure out the derivative of that integral, even if we can't figure out the integral itself, kind of loosely speaking. So that's the idea with the fundamental theorem of calculus. You're like, all right, I don't really get it. Don't worry. Students never do the first time they see it. It's kind of weird. It doesn't feel right. It feels like contrived problems with answers that are easy to come up with, but not really understanding how I'm getting there. If that's how it feels, that's perfect. That's how it's supposed to feel. But we'll get the hang of it. But we're not quite done yet. Because what I've so shown you so far deals with this fundamental theorem of calculus, but there's kind of a more general form. Note that in all of these examples, the upper bound of integration was the variable x. 
There's another type of question I want you to be able to answer, and it's when the upper bound of integration is not the variable x, but instead a function itself. So note that in this problem, I wish I hadn't made these all twos, because it kind of implies that this has to be a two, but it doesn't. Any variable here, this will work. Suppose my function f of x, instead of being the integral from two to x of some function like three t squared, it was the integral from two to sine of x of some function three t squared. Then what's f prime of x? And you're like, all right, I don't really like these, but at least f prime of x is really easy to come up with. f prime of x is always just g of x, where g is this inside function here, change the variable from t to x, for some weird reason that I don't quite get, and that's my answer. And maybe I can work backwards through these steps and get full credit on this on a quiz or midterm or whatever. Well, there's a little bit more going on here. It turns out that the answer is not so obvious here. It's not g of x. It's g of h of x times h prime of x. But where in the world did this, what's going on here? Turns out this is just chain rule, kind of in disguise. When we're taking a derivative, if the function is a uh, composition of two different functions, we've got to use the chain rule. And what you'll see is essentially when this up here is a function other than x, it invokes the chain rule. And I'll show you how as I go through these examples. So we could figure out the answer without doing any of the work. But maybe what I'll do is I'll do the work this time, come up with the answer, and then show you how we could have predicted that answer once you understand this form, which looks really complicated now, but it's really not that bad. All you're going to do is you're going to copy what's written here, except you're going to change all the t's into, you're like, oh yeah, x is x is, I got it. Nope. Into sine of x. You're going to take what's written here, which was formerly an x, and you're going to change all your t's into that thing. So you're not going to change all your t's into x's, you're going to change all your t's into sine of x's. To make a weird plural there. And you're like, all right, then I'm done. Nope. And you have to tack on the derivative of this function here because of the chain rule. Let me show you. So f of x is equal to this thing. Let's figure out another way to write f of x. Let's not worry about derivatives yet. Let's figure out how to evaluate this definite integral. Well, I guess I need to figure out the antiderivative. It's the same function we saw before. This antiderivative is just t cubed. I need to evaluate that from 2 to sine of x, which is kind of weird. A couple minutes ago, I was only comfortable evaluating this from two different numbers, like two to five, two different constants. And then I guess I bought where I could make this an x. Now we're making this a function sine of x. It doesn't mess things up. Don't worry about it. The t's change into sine of x. So I got sine of x cubed. Uh, and then the t's change into, whoop, not equals, minus. The t's change into twos, and I get two cubed. In other words, I got sine cubed x here, minus eight. Sine of x cubed is often written this way, even though it's kind of counterintuitive. It looks like the sine part's being cubed and the x isn't, which isn't the case. It might help you to think about it this way, but the more commonly way it's written is this. That's f of x. So that's my answer. No, it's not asking for f of x. It's asking for f prime of x. Oh, okay. I can figure that out because I'm really good at figuring out derivatives because I took calc 1. i got to take the derivative of this function. It might be easier to take the derivative of this form of it. Chain rule. The outside function is the stuff being cubed. So bring that 3 down in front, and then subtract 1 from the exponent, leaving the inside alone. And then I'm done? No, because you've got to apply the chain rule. The derivative of sine is cosine. So I tack on a cosine x here. The derivative of this is just a constant, so minus 0 if you want. This would be my final answer. I claim that you could have predicted this answer from the start. How could you have predicted this answer from the start? You take my function here, g of t, and you rewrite it as g of h of x, where h of x is the function up here. So you copy this function, g of t, and you replace all the t's with whatever h of x is. So instead of 3t squared, I'll write 3 something squared, that's something being sine of x. That's this part of the formula. But then I'm not done. I have to multiply by h prime of x. I have to multiply by the derivative of this function. The derivative of sine is cosine. I get here. This answer, same answer I had here. I could have predicted the answer from the start, but the purpose of this section is less about knowing the answer and more about kind of showing the answer. Proving, I don't know if that's the right word to use here. In fact, I know it's not the right word to use here. Um, what you're coming up with. So that's the idea for this problem. There's an analog to this one, just like what we did here when we didn't know the antiderivative, but we could still get the answer.
We do that down here. So I'm going to show you how to do that, and then we'll call it good. One observation here. I'm used to the x squared being on top. I'm used to the function, either the x or the function here, being up top. It has to be the upper bound of my integral in order for the fundamental theorem of calculus to apply. Same thing happens here. In order for my fundamental theorem of calculus to apply, I have to rewrite this. Right? The integral from, maybe note, I don't know, sure, the, that f of x can be rewritten as, instead of the integral from x cubed to 2, I could write it as the integral from 2 to x cubed. And you just change the bounds of integration like that? Well, only if you put a negative out in front. So it's the integral from 2 to x cubed of 3t squared over 1 plus t cubed uh, dt. So if you want, you can change the original question into this, or you can wait to change the original question into this. The idea, the reason you'd want to write the original question this way is because now the fundamental theorem of calculus, this more general form of it, will apply. So now I can figure out exactly what my answer should end up being. I'm going to copy exactly what's written right here. This is f of t. No, g of t. What have we been calling it? g of t. Except I'm going to replace all the t's with whatever my function h of x is. In this case, that function h of x is x cubed. So I'm going to write f prime of x is equal to the negative of, let's see, I'm going to copy exactly what's written here. So I'd have 3 times something squared over 1 plus something cubed. And that something, instead of being a t, is going to be an x cubed. Because the fundamental theorem of calculus tells me that I have to evaluate g, this inner function, at h of x, where h of x is my upper bound of integration. So in both of these blanks, I'm going to put this x cubed. And then I'm going to almost be done, but not quite. Because this formula is telling me you're not done. You still have to multiply by h prime of x. Why? Because of the chain rule, as we'll see in a minute. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to multiply it by the derivative of h of x, which was x cubed. I get 3x squared. Yeah, you can clean this up if you want. Um, what is this? 3x to the 6th power over 1 plus x to the 9th power. Uh, and then I'm going to multiply that by 3x squared. That's my friends giving me a hard time for making math videos on a Friday night and not coming out with them. I think I'll probably go out then when I finish this. 3 times 3 is 9. x cubed times x squared is x to the 8th over 1 plus x to the 9th. If you felt like cleaning this up a little bit, you could. Or you could state your answer here. f prime of x, we figured it out. I want to kind of prove that this works. I want to show how we can get to this answer, kind of a longer method. But we can predict what the answer should be just based on the formula. I'll show you how to prove this, and that'll be the end of this video, and we'll call this good. So what are we going to do here? We're going to do the same method we've been doing. So I got f of x. Oh, I forgot my negative here, huh? I forgot to write this negative and this negative. Whatever. Sure. Uh, f of x is equal to, see, I want to evaluate this integral. Oh, I don't know how to evaluate this integral because I don't know the antiderivative of 3t squared over 1 plus t cubed. And yes, I know. For those of you that have seen u substitution, you'll know how to do this soon. Um, but for now, why don't we do a little clever substitution where we let g of t be equal to that thing, 3t squared over 1 plus t cubed. Then my function f of x is just the integral from x cubed up to 2 of what? Of little g of t, dt. Okay, so how else can you write this? Can you evaluate? Oh, this is an x. It's supposed to say a 2. So now it kind of says a 2. Um, can I evaluate this? Sure. You'd have to know the antiderivative of this function, which you do know, or at least you have something that you can write for it, capital G of t. The antiderivative of little g of t is capital G of t. I have to evaluate that from x cubed to 2. Uh, all right, so it's capital G of 2 minus capital G of x cubed. Yeah, just plugging these in. That gets me here. And my answer? No, because all I'm doing is working on f of x. That's this thing up here. The question's asking about f prime. That's this thing down here. It's asking me for the derivative of this. Okay, f prime of x. Well, let's see, the derivative of this part. This is a constant. 
right? I don't know the function, capital G of X, but I do know if I changed all the X's, all the variables into twos, I'd get some number. Take the derivative of that number, it's just a zero. Derivative of constant is zero. This is just zero minus, yeah, you don't have to write that zero. The derivative of this function, what would be chain rule, right? You have an outer function, capital G, and an inner function, X cubed. The, what you do when you're using the chain rule, you take the derivative of the outer function, so this capital G changes into a little g, and you leave the inner function alone. But then you're not done. You have to multiply that inner function, or sorry, you have to multiply that by the derivative of that inner function, which is 3x squared. So f prime of x is this mess. And this mess I know because g of t is defined up here. So I can copy what's written here. Zero, I don't have to write that. Minus, there's that negative that I was talking about. Little g of x cubed. Let's copy this right here, except change all the t's into x cubes. That's exactly what this is saying. That's exactly what you did over here. So I copy this function. I got 3 times something squared over 1 plus something cubed. And those somethings are not t's. They're x cubes. And then I'm not done. I have to multiply that by 3x squared. And what you'll realize is what is written here is identical, hopefully, to what is written up here. So you can simplify it the same way you did and come to this answer right here. The takeaway for this is the fundamental theorem of calculus. I want you to be able to do it in two different ways. I want you to do it whether you know the antiderivative of a function, like 3t squared, or whether you don't yet or ever know the antiderivative of a function, like this mess right here. If it's something for which you don't know the antiderivative, you do this little substitution trick, little g's and big g's. If you do know the antiderivative, you don't need to do that substitution trick. You don't need little bigs, little g's and big g's. You just evaluate the antiderivative directly, or the integral directly, the definite integral. And then take the derivative. And that derivative will be your answer. And it's worth noting that you know the answer before you go through that process. Right? You should always... You should never get the answer wrong. You should always be able to predict what the answer is if you understand the fundamental theorem of calculus. What the fundamental theorem of calculus tells you is that if you are evaluating from a constant to x some function, the derivative of that is just that function on the inside if you make the variables work out right. Copy exactly what's written here, change all the t's to x's. As long as it's an x, what if it's not an x? What if it's a function? Well, fine, it's kind of the same idea. You're going to copy exactly what's written here, except you're going to change all the t's into whatever this is, sine of x. And then you're going to remember that you're not done. You have to multiply by the derivative. And you can do that whether you have a function whose antiderivative you know, like 3t squared's antiderivative being t cubed, or if you have a function whose antiderivative you don't know, like uh, this mess right here. And then one last little trick to keep in mind, if your uh, limits of integration are ever in the wrong order, you just tack on a negative sign to make things work out. All right, so if the x cube's down on the bottom and you want it up top, you can switch those by putting on a negative. And that'll make everything work out and you get your answer. If you can follow that, that's exactly what you'll need for the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I'll end this video here. We'll review this more when I see you on Wednesday, but hopefully this is enough so that we can finish this stuff on Wednesday. So hopefully this makes some sense to people. I will see you in a few days.